Welcome to the Everybody Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we have Brendan from FT Executive joining us today, talking all about CX. Brendan, tell us a little bit about what CX is and why you're on the podcast sharing everything about that. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, I suppose CX is, is really open to interpretation of what it really is, but essentially, it, as everyone knows, it's customer experience. It's about understanding who your customers are, what your product is, and aligning that what your customers' needs and requirements really are. And it's kind of famous saying of making sure you're selling the right product to the right people in the right format. Mm-hmm. So, from a, what's your a bit of a background, your experience in terms of how you, how did you get into CX in this particular role? So CX for me, I kind of fell into it. I have a big background in kind of strategic sales, account management, kind of 15, 16 years in that role. About eight years ago, I moved into a very project-based sales role where looking after individual clients. So to give you an example, we worked with government departments, emergency services to be specific. So we didn't necessarily have more clients, but it was about understanding the clients we did have and, and their life cycle, where then I started looking more into that journey mapping how to map out the best experience for our customers and then came across customer experience. So over the last eight years in particular, really working out in process improvement space and kind of building on those core competencies around CX and then moving into a startup environment. So working with small scale startups, uh, bootstrapping or kind of round out funding to help put in place that process of customer experience and help it scale with the business to make sure that, as I mentioned, they're selling the right product to the right people and not just assuming they're doing the right thing. I think it's one of the biggest things is one of, in terms of stats out there, any startup especially, if they're um, looking to venture into Mm. a business, mostly falls over just because of wrong product market fit and that's not understanding the customer or doing your market research. How have you found working with startups Mm. compared to, pre-existing businesses and the differences in that and getting in early from a customer experience perspective, what can that mean to a startup? So I think to to kind of look at that, you have to take it back a step and look at the core competencies of Mm -hmm. of customer experience. And really it looks at those kind of calls around culture, internal culture in an actual organization to make sure it's not just the product and what you're selling aligns Mm -hmm. to the customer but the team that you have around you is customer focused and how they're actually delivering that product. That the communications are state steady between right through whether it's marketing, sales, account management, or customer service. Then you got to look at the metrics, how you're actually collecting those metrics, what you're collecting and how you're using that. Because that falls into then things like voice of the customer and understanding then how that goes. Um, and then you've got the whole experience and design and strategy around customer experience. So every business has a sales strategy or a corporate strategy that how they want to build and how they want to structure the business. But not a lot of people actually understand yes. how to do a customer strategy, how they're actually going to engage, how they're going to keep up with that customer. Customer needs change every week or every day. And you see a lot of businesses mm-hmm. actually put in place a strategy that will do it for two or three years. So to go back to your question on how it's different for kind of a startup against a, a bigger organization, like if you look at the the big four, for example, you've got the the ANZs, the the Commonwealth Bank. They have massive CX teams who are struggling to really get a comprehension of culture across the organization, leadership alignment to make sure that leaders actually understand the benefits of CX. Where then you go to a startup environment, it's a lot easier and more transparent. There's a lot more cooperation and communication between the departments. Mm-hmm. One business I worked with recently, 50 staff, eight leaders in the, in the organization. So the, the founder actually pulled together a, a group of people that he knew were able to go and be able to build a new business. And the, all those people came in with their own individual ideas of ways to kind of operate finance and then operating the actual product development, sales. But bringing in a CX strategy into it really brought these guys into alignment. And that was able to be done in three, four, six months, where you look at the bigger mm-hmm. corporates, it's a three, four, six year project. And you mentioned culture, culture back there. Yeah. So that probably plays a massive part yeah. when you've got 20, 30, 50,000 people. A culture is very hard to influence and change in such a big scale. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, when those businesses are set up to run mm-hmm. the way they are, it's hard to divert that off their path. Yeah, exactly. And look, they do it really well. Uh, in fairness, you, you, I, I know people at all those different um, the big fours who are in those roles and doing amazing work and actually aligning that culture and kind of building that brand and that messaging. 
but it's slow and it's hard work and there's a lot of investment. And what people don't realize is there's a lot of ROI involved in customer experience. When you actually look at, so there's actually a thing called the, the CXI, the Customer Experience Index. It's a the Forrester Group, a big research organization who do look at all the different uh, customer-centric organizations out there and they rate them. So mm-hmm. big organizations, really customer-centric, will rate really high. They actually did a study last year where over the last five years, if you invested in the top 10 rated CXI companies and then invested the same amount in the bottom 10, you tenfold your money in the top 10 where you'd lose a lot of money in the other ones. So there's actually massive tra- comparisons between how customer-centric you are, how much customers are willing to pay for your product, how much the extra they're willing to pay for it as well, and how likely they are to keep using your product and, and recommending it as well. Now, CX is obviously... Uh a big category right it's it's becoming like and it should be it's all about the customer we deliver a business there to serve a customer so if i were to pair this right back to the starting point where does a business even start from looking at and the key word you mentioned here is customer focused what are some of the core activities i can be doing as a business to ensure that the product we're developing is going down the right path it is customer focused mm-hmm. Should I involve our customers? What what strategies could I implement to do this? So I suppose the, the, the other thing with CX, it has to come from the top. It has to be the leader of the organization has to have that willingness to to put this process or project in place and follow it through. Mm-hmm. And that's the okay. first step and probably the most crucial step. Then it's going to be down around the kind of culture alignment. You need your team around mm-hmm. you to be able to deliver on that as well. So really, it's kind of looking down. I always suggest to people like the the CXPA is the the internationally recognized customer experience professional association. Thousands of members, they actually certify individuals to be customer customer experience professionals. They break it down into six core competencies. And you almost need to have an understanding of this, those okay. six core companies before you start going anywhere. Mm. But the first step is really talk to someone mm. and actually understand what they're currently doing. Like me, for example, I've got a, a CX assessment that I've run through with clients before I even actually take on any work to understand where mm. they are in the, the customer centric kind of profile. How aware are they? How active are they? And how, how encouraged are they to actually make a change? Yeah, so that's the basic first step. So yeah, it's more the awareness side. So and what what would a business look? It's it's an interesting conversation because it's very um, look. I can say I'm customer focused, but how do you measure that? What do you do to measure that? <laughs> yeah. What does that even so mean? So what does what, what does, does that mean? mean? Yeah. So how do you measure it? What what sort of points do you get a, a tick for? Yeah, so I'm customer focused. Look, there's a range of different things. I don't think there's any one in particular thing to say, yeah, okay, you tick this box and you're customer centric. Um, that wouldn't have meant to be one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nah. Look, there's, I, I ran a poll, uh, about two weeks ago on my LinkedIn and actually asked people, yes. did you think your organization was customer centric? Surprisingly enough, 60% of people came back and said, yes, 100% customer. Mm-hmm. A few people came back and said, we think so, but we're not sure. About mm-hmm. 30% then came back and said, management would like to be, and not even, Five percent came back and said, "No, it's not a priority." So, of those kind of sixty okay. percent, I actually followed up with every single one of those people to kind of come back and say, "Well, why do you think you're customer centric?" Half of them didn't mm-hmm. respond to that message. Um, the other <laughs> half it did. It was really, yes. it, was, it was a really interesting kind of correlation of information between some who really were customer centric. They were actively engaging in in projects to look at what the customers' needs were today, but also look at what those mm-hmm. customers' needs were going to be in the future. Funny enough, another recruitment company who we're slight competitors, but we actually share a bit of information with. I was really impressed with them going out and they were looking at, they've got a 95% retention rate, which is amazing. But their main focus is looking at why there's a 5% drop off, not the 95. And then you're looking at kind of what that long term strategy is. So it's a combination of all those things and based off and, and how willing people are to, to be engaged mm-hmm. and kind of develop and, and investment. Is there actually investment in the business? Like I always look at organizations saying, okay, yes, we're creating a customer experience team. And then I look at it as like, well, all they've done is they've converted five of the customer service agents into customer experience people, which is great. Yes. It's a great step. Well, yes. customer service Total agents change, are basically. Resolve issues. Yes. Exactly. And, and yeah. doesn't give them any more flexibility or any more kind of movement in the organization. They're literally there to resolve issues that are already occurring and impacting the customer where a true customer experience mm-hmm. individual is there to resolve the issues before they even impact the customer. Yeah, so... It's a different mindset. It's more of a proactive rather than a reactive role. 
Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that scenario I'm guessing is just so they can say they can, they have the customer mm-hmm. experience team yeah. as opposed to actually really yeah. having yeah. one. And look, I've, I've got to be careful in saying that because there's a lot of good CX people who are in customer service mm-hmm. roles and, and leading those teams and are doing great work. Yes. I think the, yes. the difference is when organizations look at that as when I'm talking to, well, even when I talk to people and say I'm a, a CX consultant, they say, oh, well, how many people are in your call center? What call center? I'm, I'm not a customer <laughs> service agent. So um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I might ask this question in a different light. So what's a day in a life of a, a CX consultant or person that's working in CX look like or a week? What do they do? What are they, what are their core responsibilities? What are their KPIs? What's important to them? to hit the targets mm. that business is looking to strive for? So me personally, I break it down into a few different groupings depending on the project. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the work mm-hmm. I do is around that uh, cultural alignment and working with the different okay. stakeholders across different departments. So if I give you rather than a day-to-day, kind of a life cycle of a project for me is coming in mm-hmm. and looking at the the existing framework of the organization, how much communications, basically, are they a silo organization or is there a good flow of information? Yes. Then we start looking at actually that the customer journey. So it's not just about the customer when they're actually customers, but what brings them in to be customers? How do they come across that product? How are we impacting them? And then once they are customers, what are we collecting from them? How are we actually managing them? Are we are we really focusing on them as because we want to keep them as customers or are we actually just putting them in a kind of customer pile and saying, great, we've got a customer. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of about that long-term cycle. So as I mentioned, so my, my background has been predominantly in account management, seeing kind of strategic sales roles. So yes. for me, it's always been the excitement of not getting a customer. You can, you can get a customer, but it's keeping a customer as a hard work. And that's where your value is. It's a lot cheaper to keep a customer as well than actually going out and getting mm. a new one, but it's a lot harder too. So you do mm-hmm. have to make sure you're, you're, you're keeping up in touch with them. You're keeping up with what they need. And then it's the, the whole journey of that and communicating that across the organization. So that kind of gives you a, a quick snapshot. And that's just that's one project that I'll, I'll actively run um, every couple of weeks with a different client. Okay. So it's understanding really the value chain of a customer conversation and interaction with the business. Get it. Now, what are, if I'm a startup, starting a business or in business, whatever it might be, what are some of the key principles? Now, you mentioned there's six categories and six areas. Can we go through those and just explore a little bit around those in terms of what else we might want to consider? Yeah, so you've got, like, you start going into the customer-centric culture is the, is the big one, is the mm-hmm. first one. You know, the adoption is the second one. Can Next you go back to culture for a minute? Yeah. Just in yeah. culture, like, is what are some of the key values that a business needs to have to be really customer centric? What are what do our people need to be doing, thinking, and even mm. what do they need to be valuing to serve a customer in in the right frame of reference from a CX perspective? So I think it's more of an alignment to the business values net rather than necessarily just being customer centric. Um, you can go out and hire okay. anybody, and they're going to say yes, they're really customer yeah. valued, a customer centric person. Mm. But it's about the values you portray as a business and make sure those people actually align to that as well. So every company now has values that they, they follow, they, they align to. Yes. And yes, it's going out, it's trying to find that culture fit for the, into your own current culture, but also that culture yes. add. So who's going to come in and actually encourage the team or who's got the different experience in different areas as well? Like I always like to say, like sales guys, I'm a sales guy. I love account management. I love strategic you know, like, um, major account management and I love customer service. I think they're really good roles and important roles in the business. But then making sure there's actually cooperation then between marketing. So yeah, it's, it's just a little bit more of an alignment of culture rather than a single culture fit. Yeah, I don't mm-hmm. like that. Even when I've hired to my own teams, if you're just hiring for the same culture, you're just replacing it, mm-hmm. kind of replicating what you already have. You're better off adding mm-hmm. to it and kind of building on different things that can improve the, the business rather okay. than doing what's already there. Makes sense. Yep, get that. Okay, so mm-hmm. culture is um, obviously there's some alignment to what <laughs> your core values are as a business and projecting yeah. out to the marketplace, but someone that can maybe push the boundaries a little bit and add a bit of different yeah. thinking, innovative thinking to the business rather than just same, same. Yeah, exactly. And look, it's like the recent business I was involved in, rather than going hiring another yeah. marketer, they went and got a growth mm-hmm. hacker. Same, same. They're still in the same area, but it's a different kind of different kind of methodology that they work towards and different tools that they use rather than just having another marketing person. Same with the sales team. Like you've got, you've got sales, but and the old age old farmer against kind of the, the hunter. 
and, and having a diversity between that. So even those guys who are doing BD roles, but they need to be not just out there to get the bonus and the commission. They need to actually have a customer-centric value to be, okay, I want to get this customer on. I want to get them on ethically. I want to be able to do this properly, not just get the money in, mm -hmm. because that's going to filter through the life cycle of that customer as well. Yeah, it impacts the journey, doesn't it? So okay. if the customer comes on board yeah. just for a sale or for commission, then they're not really looked after in the end. So, yeah, it's, I think it's understanding yeah. the value chain is important when you look at it from the customer journey. Mm. Yeah. You're not treating them as a transaction. Look, exactly that. And then it's even, even that kind of filters into those other kind of, kind, of met, kind of competencies around the metrics and the ROI as well around, okay, well, you can bring in thousands upon thousands of customers and just kind of just say, get them in just for a commission. But how many of those customers are you keeping and you recurring? Um, like you look at some of the, the top companies out there. They are actually a company I was doing work with recently. They, uh, they're paying massive sales bonuses to the sales team. They had, I think, off, off rough averages, they had about 650 new customers come on a year, but they're losing 750. So there was no <laughs> so they're going backwards. They're, actually <laughs> losing, they're going backwards, but the sales team are there yes. accelerating massive bonuses and the account management team, the customer service team are getting in the backside as to why are you guys not delivering? Why, why aren't you able mm -hmm. to keep the customers? It goes really back to that kind of, well, okay, well, what are we actually, what, how are we communicating to these guys? What are we actually collecting? What are we telling them? What are we selling them to be able mm. to collect that data? Are we selling them the right product? Is this what they're actually looking for? Mm -hmm. Again, it's the, the sales guy goes in and says, yes, our product can do that. But can they? Can, can it do that? Because it's the account management team. So it's, it's about that understanding and it's training and development. And there's no such thing as getting this done overnight and creating a customer centric business overnight. It is more about changing that way of thinking, changing your hiring processes, changing the kind of the culture of the team and, and the benefits. And it's communicating. It's, it's letting people know that, hey, we brought in 650 customers last year, but we lost 750. Why? Well, what's the difference? Well, why are these guys dropping off and looking at it as a whole and not just a, a single department issue? Yeah, it's not a good position to be when you, you're losing more customers and you're gaining, even though they're big numbers, that's pretty crazy. Mm. So with with CX, we're we're talking to non techs people building product. Now, what we find is yes, there's a whole journey of managing a customer, but there's also a journey of getting the product and the, and the the product fit right for the customer. How would you inter, intertwine those principles of CX into developing a product? Could that be something that we could mm -hmm. explore a little bit? Yeah, honestly. So again, one of the other core competencies around is that kind of design thinking. It's looking at what you have as a product and what your customer actually wants. So there's, mm -hmm. there's really good information out there and kind of different books you can go and read and different courses you can do in design thinking alone. But you start looking at, well, what are you developing? As I mentioned at the start of the call, it's developing the right product for the right customer in the right way. It's kind of the car insurance salesman, or the car insurance. <laughs> okay, you're developing car insurance. You're selling it to people who own cars. But how are you actually marketing it to them? And how are they actually going to be delivered to them? There's no point going out to a fishing cop show and delivering it that way. Mm -hmm. From a product side, it's the exact same thing. It's, well, okay, well, you've got a product team or who are coming up with concepts and there's you've got a product team who are developing out the design and the thinking of what needs to be developed. And you have a development team then developing that who are then generally li liaising with the different marketing teams, maybe and promoting some uh, release notes as things are kind of being released. What I suppose is more about understanding, okay, well, why are you developing those features in the first place? Who's asked for them? Is it one person has asked for them or is it because there's an actual industry requirement for them? Okay. It's about getting in kind of doing those kind of, of focus groups like i'm i'm an advocate for metrics but i hate surveys i just the, the data that comes back from surveys is terrible because it's generally it's people who are either really happy with your product and are happy to give you a yes. survey or people who are really just unhappy with your product and want to complain about it but it's the people in the middle who you want to really hear from they're the people who will who are the silent kind of observers who don't actually make kind of make any noise but they're the ones who mm -hmm. could potentially become those advocates for your business so if you've already launched a product, get some of your existing customers in and ask them honest questions. Ask them why they actually signed up to your product in the first place, what they enjoyed about it, what they liked about it, what would they like to see in the future. And likewise, if you have any kind of plans on changing, especially big changes, ask those customers again, how would that affect the onboarding process or how would that affect what you've done, how they came into your product? Would they still have signed up if this was a feature or if they got rid of another feature? 
And likewise, back onto the, the metric side, it's well, look at the metrics. Look at make sure you're what you're looking at is actually relevant. We had one client a, a while back now, but they they were about to make two or three of their core features redundant because they thought no nobody was using it. That nobody ever complained about it, nobody ever talked about it. They never got any calls from customer experience or customer service about it. They actually introduced Mixpanel. So I don't know if you guys have used Mixpanel, really good analytic tool, literally tracks every single click you go through the system. Turns out those two modules were the most used modules in the system. But they never actually asked people about it. <laughs> Awareness is important. Yeah, the silent, <laughs> yeah. so the silent majority never yes. mentioned it. Exactly. So it's about actually looking at it, looking at all the data, talking to people. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of different aspects to CX. There's not just one, one shoe fits all. But particularly from a development sense, and even actually, I've got to admit, some of the best kind of CX consultants I've met out there are actually from product development because they understand that life cycle of the product and how that can affect the customer. And in terms of mix panel, I think that's um, a topic of discussion because if you are developing a product and something you can track what users are actually using within a product, especially if you've got something mm-hmm. within customers and clients and um, you can see, yeah, results like that where they're using features you didn't expect or they're following a certain yeah. chain of events that you didn't even realize or there's a bottleneck somewhere that mm. you need to work on. So I think having that that data to back up decisions is really important, probably not when you're mm. first building, but when you're starting to evolve with customers, having data is yeah. pivotal because, yeah, we can just make decisions and I've, I've been conscious of this within some of the products that we develop. just make decisions because you think they're right, but then you start questioning, all right, let's talk to some customers first and, um, yeah, get some real feedback because that's where the quality is. But sometimes the customers don't know. So something like Mick Panel is a good way to get that information without even asking. Mm. And, look, and even simple things like Power BI, anyone using a uh, SQL system can link with Power BI and take all that data and see where people are going and where they're moving. It doesn't necessarily have to be something as complex as Mixpanel. But then again, Mixpanel, I love it because it's as easy. It's, you can make it as easy or as simple as you want. And no, I'm not paid yes. by Mixpanel. <laughs> I just really like the system. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, and that's, that's probably one of the crucial things when it comes to metrics is not just collecting them but how you use them yes. and who has access to them and what you're actually using them for. Because again, yeah, I've seen companies who the marketing team or the sales team are the only people who have access to metrics because they're the only ones who think they need it. But then development team, product team, really need Yeah, it product well. direction, yeah, it really needs that information too to make better mm-hmm. decisions and improvements on products. So yeah, I think giving it to mm-hmm. sales and marketing, yes, can help with sales and marketing because they can sell the key features and benefits. But yeah, there's other there's more to that than just sales and marketing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I go through the customer journey. What should I be looking at when just looking through the customer journey? Should I be you mentioned a series of like um getting focus groups together. How would I start mapping out my current customer journey if I haven't mapped this out before and we're just running business as usual or we just started out the process? How should I begin doing that? There's, there's two ways because customer journey mapping can get really complex. There's no, there's not one customer. There's loads of different personas yeah. to do. To, to kind of give myself a plug and other consultants, one of the things with having a CX consultant is that they've done it before because if you haven't done it, it can get really complex. Uh, mm-hmm. You can really make start making it simple though. But it's, if you oversimplify it, you're going to miss a lot of data. If you overcomplicate yes. it, you're going to be swallowed up with data. I suppose the way I like to do it is, is kind of develop out those 15 different grids of, okay, well, what is that life cycle of the customer? Where do they come across our product in the first place? How do they come across it? Is it online? Is it in the newspaper? Is it word of mouth? What that onboarding process looks like? How long does it take? And going through all those different stages, but then also at the same time, you have to get the data back from people. You, you can't just assume what you're looking at is correct. It's always good to actually pick up the phone. And, and that's what I'm an advocate for in, in being able to communicate with those customers. One, because you get the true, honest answer. Not the customers who are the ones who always reach out, the customers who you never hear from. Try to get the information off them. But then also as well, making sure that they, they feel wanted, loved, and that their opinion counts, but that you're actually making sure that the data you have is relevant. And follow that through. And don't just start as soon as you get the sale. It has to be the entire life cycle of your customer from when they first come in contact with your, your product, service, whatever you're doing, to when they leave and why they leave. And that's the, the entire part of it. Okay. So just talking about is obviously the awareness factor. So understanding what the journey is. 
How do we go about improving that journey now? Is that just through customer focus groups, ideation, design thinking? What processes do we use to improve it? Look, analyzing that data and making assumptions? Yeah, look. Or how do you correlate that to the all outcomes? Of the above. So I, I always said that um, process improvement people make the best CX people because they're actually really good at looking at all those different steps and processes in, 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 the, in the journey. Um, they're used to listening to kind of that voice of the customer and that journey map in, in some way or shape or form. The It really comes down to the different obstacles that each individual business has. Like I know business I worked for recently, they had no manual onboard or automated onboarding process. It was heavily automated. If they got any more than it was any more than six customers on at one time, they were really struggling to deliver. And the onboarding mm-hmm. process was two or three months. So I meant if you had an eighth customer come on board, they were waiting almost five months to come onto your system, which is terrible. Okay, well, Granted they're generally bigger customers, so cover the cost. Yes. But it's looking at that individual step of, okay, well, how do we pr- speed up that uh, that onboarding process? And then other things is kind of maybe it's the once they're on board, maybe they just they fall off the map as far as communication. They don't feel like they've been kept updated with updates. So it really comes down to what you find during that map and kind of that those different stages of the, the life cycle of the customer where you that you were, first of all, you assume, which is the, mm. the kind of evil part of customer experience. You assume part first and then you validate. And once you validate that that's an issue, then you can start looking at ways to improve it. But again, be careful to 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 over improve. I did a blog recently. I mentioned in, in the, another company who similar things had a really labor intensive onboarding process. Went and automated the entire process. Then discovered that that was actually their key selling difference compared to their competitors was actually that manual onboarding process where that kind of human element of walking the customer through it. And as soon as they went mm-hmm. to onboarding it. All those feedback and recommendations that people had were no longer validated. Like it wasn't a great experience. Okay. It was complex. It was hard. It was there was errors in it, and they didn't feel like they were supported. So just by solving one issue doesn't mean you actually just go and fix that one issue. You've got to look at why, how, and, and what impact that will have as well. Now, with the trends on that, what are you finding in relation to fully automated and still human interaction? Because some things I love just automated, I can do that, but some things I, I prefer some human touch. So. Does it depend on product, service? How do you analyze that? How do you look at that? Once again, just look at data or what, what do you recommend there? It's a, it's a tough one to answer because there's so many different variations of it. I'm kind of, what is satisfaction for one might be a, a hindrance for another. In, like, I always like to make sure that when I'm looking at individual steps in the process, it's, it's communicated. Well, not just to the customer, but internal people in the organization as well. Make sure you've got consensus to why the change. But I suppose it is more about making sure that you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. Yes. What a, mm. just because it's probably a customer decision, which what they prefer, whether it's automated mm. or manual. And I think that's an interesting point, Anthony. Like, People are different. We all have different personas, personalities. Some people like to read. Some people like to watch video. Some people like to listen to audio podcasts. Everyone takes, consumes content, different products differently. So should we be considering Mm. customer journey mapping based on different types of personas and personalities or is that a step too far? No, 100%. I mean, that's the, that's why, as I mentioned earlier, that, that's part of the trick and actually, mapping uh-huh. a journey because there's so yes. many different personas mm. like i was reading one article recently where a company had 75 different personas of customer journey maps it's overkill <laughs> wow there's, there's no need yeah, to have 75. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, I, I was looking i was like that's just somebody with way too much time or too many resources where you can go and develop yes. 75 persona based journey maps uh-huh. it's more about yes it, it's looking at the kind of the key differentiators and like i don't like answering the question of what's better between automated or not because yeah. it's on the system and like oh, me yes. personally i go into companies that you need to automate your system it's complex but then there's other systems like, no, you need to keep this manual. Mm-hmm. There is no straight answer. Uh, I don't think there's, there ever will be. It depends on how sophisticated your system mm-hmm. is. But then that kind of goes back to, yeah, each individual person depends who you're selling to. Are they sophisticated? Are they not? If you've got an enterprise mm-hmm. product, you, you're going to be selling it to organizations who probably have their own tech team who can probably do a lot of the work themselves. Yes. Or if you're selling it mm-hmm. to kind of, B to C and you're selling to Joseph off the street who has no technical experience. Well, you're going to want to make sure that's as automated as possible. So it really comes down to the product fit rather than just the persona fit as well. Get it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. 
And then probably making sure you're automating it in the right way yes. and not causing issues down the line like your other yeah. example. Yeah. Get it. So across those journeys, then you might have variance in the way you serve customers based on maybe the type of customer they are, for example. So I think that's something we do in our business a little bit. We look at maybe even asking the customer how they want things. So we work in a highly technical mm. space where we're delivering in, in engineering documents with specifications around how we build tech and some customers just want to see that it's there. Some customers, technical people want to dig through it. Some customers just have no interest at all in seeing that stuff. So I think our learning has been just asking the customer to what extent and what level do you need X, Y, Z? And I think that just helps the process rather than just doing the same yeah. thing for everyone. If we get, if we get customers who want the three page version or the mm-hmm. 350 page version yeah. Yeah, of the same thing. There's a variance there. So. I, I- and similar to what we do in CX as well, it's, it's, mm-hmm. as a CX consultant, we ask why. We ask what yes. they actually want and why. That's that's the next part. Mm-hmm. It's trying to understand, yes, they, especially in startup land, mm-hmm. you've got founders and developers who have these great ideas for building an amazing product. But why? Mm-hmm. Why are you actually trying to deliver? Okay, you want to be able to sell it for a billion dollars in, in two years' time, or you want to be able to go for a round day funding in 18 months. But Why? What is your actual end goal in actually achieving this? Because that makes a big difference in what you're developing, how you're developing, and what kind of resource you need then as well. Otherwise, are the pivotal questions to begin with. So, yeah, why mm. is the customer going to buy this? What's the burning desire, especially if you're building a product? Mm. Is it a problem that the customer can live with? Or is it something that, yes, if they found a solution, they'll just buy tomorrow? So, yeah, what desire is there for yeah. that product? I think that's some, yeah, mm. early stage designing. Yeah, you're yeah. solving a problem that's Correct. worth solving. Correct, yeah, because yeah. mm-hmm. it has enough value. Yeah, there's for- plenty of products in the market that have been built and don't make money. It's just the reality. Yeah. It's just. And it may be one because they haven't marketed it well. Two, it's not a, a product that people are interested in at all. They sort of didn't do their market research up front. Three, maybe the mm. tech isn't as good as they thought it was, and they're in a highly competitive space. There's a number of different variants as to what it could be. So, I think mm-hmm. market research early days and getting involved and maybe designing a customer, if it not experience, at least customer onboarding, customer understanding as to why they want the product is pivotal to any success, yeah. no matter what, what you're doing. Mm, yeah, 100%. So what I'm gathering is customer experience is really process improvement for customers. <laughs> In a way, yes. Is, yeah. Am I, I missing think, something? I <laughs> yes. Look, I think, again, customer experience, it's all down to interpretation. I think that's probably the, the big aspect. And yeah, that's okay. one thing yeah. when people actually ask me around that question is where should CX fit yeah. within an organization? Yes. Because mm-hmm. personally, it's not sales. It's not marketing. It's not customer service. No. No. Is it operations? Kind of ish, kind of because it sort of steps yes. into the yeah, yeah. It's cross silo though if it's a big organization. Yeah, but it's it's like a passing the baton. It's, it's just yeah, it's early, it's lead generation. Then it gets the sales, and then it gets the onboarding, gets the customer service yeah. and support. It goes through the whole chain. Yeah, yeah. It helps. Yeah, every decision should be the guide, the guiding focus for everyone. Mm-hmm. That's the objective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's pretty much it. I suppose that. Operation side is probably the, the closest in the core, especially in startups. They don't have process improvement teams no. because they don't necessarily yeah. have any things to improve their building. Mm-hmm. But I suppose this is the difference of where, where organizations put it and what stage and how many, how much repair needs to be done or how much work needs to be done mm-hmm. to kind of get you that customer centric value. I think it's the big part. Get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. So if you were to start with a fresh canvas, and you're you're starting out a customer journey map. What do you draw? Mm-hmm. Do you draw all the conversations that you may have with the customer, all the interactions, and you start figuring out what the best way to do that is through market research, surveying, focus groups. Is that how you would start from mm-hmm. scratch if you didn't have anything? Um, so I'll probably actually use the example of Fraser Trauma Executive, yes. the, the company that we recently founded, mm-hmm. because, again, yes. it was – for us, it was very much well. I'm a CX consultant and my business partner yes. slash wife is the executive recruiter. Mm-hmm. And coming into business together, I was very conscious that I wanted to be very CX focused in everything we do, including recruitment, which traditionally doesn't necessarily have a great reputation for candidate experience mm-hmm. or client experience. Mm-hmm. So we, again, a lot of time when you're setting up these businesses and setting up product, you're generally somewhat of an expert or somewhat of a, have an understanding of the the kind of environment or the industry you're going into. I don't think anyone goes and starts a fintech company without any kind of finance experience. Sorry, fintech experience. The main knowledge uh, is required, so generally. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you've got a good framework of knowing who these people are you're going to be selling to. I think you, you already know that in your head. You might necessarily know how to articulate it, but you know it. So then it's kind of even putting down the midway step of, okay, well, these are the people. Okay, where do these people come across information? Where do they actually find it? Their, are they word of mouth people? Are they only going to buy if they hear it through somebody else? Are they going to be susceptible to, to advertising? So like, again, back to ourselves, when we were setting up a business, do we advertise? No, we're very much a word of mouth people. Mm-hmm. 95% I'd say of the work that comes through for the recruitment side is all word of mouth through for Laura because she's a bloody good recruiter. She has an amazing network, especially in Melbourne. Same with myself. I think uh, I'd say 70% of my work comes through word of mouth and people I've worked with in the past. The other 30% is probably through networking, things like doing podcasts with you guys and, and different kind of yeah. communication with people on LinkedIn. But advertisers won't work for us. So that was our kind of niche. Okay, we figured that part out. And then it was kind of how do we do that? How, how much time do we spend on resources like communicating on LinkedIn and, and networking events. Like I'm, I'm a big guy for networking events and I can't wait for this pandemic to end to actually go back to a good old fashioned network event. Some face to face, yeah. Put some face to face and have a yeah. beer with people yeah. and have a little mince pie. Uh-huh. And like that, that's a big part for us. So understanding that journey mm-hmm. and then the needs and the verticals of who you're targeting. I think that's probably the, the other bit of advice I always give people when they, especially early stage startups, they become very, they, don't, they think they're industry agnostic and they might be. But if they spread their attention too thin, they're not going to be able to give enough attention to any one vertical. So it's more about actually focusing on where you're going to go and how you're going to go that direction. I think that's um, one of the biggest pitfalls of building a tech product. You Mm -hmm. can assume that you're trying to serve everybody and spreading your wings Mm -hmm. or spreading too thin. So yeah, one of the, one of the biggest things that we've found being in tech and delivering tech products is niching is probably the biggest decision you need to make and people are fearful Mm -hmm. of that because they feel like they're closing the market down. But in reality, you basically open your, yourself up to better serving a customer. And maybe that's mm-hmm. one of those verticals or journeys that we talked to about, about or the personas that we talked about. It could be a, a market. Serve them right, serve that industry right, and you'll better serve your products and mm-hmm. the customers within that industry and then allow yourself to grow from there. Niching down is is quite powerful. We've done this within one of our – we've got a SaaS product in pharmacy – and we specifically could go to retail, but we chose not to because we can better serve that industry by mm-hmm. understanding and working with them. And the value that you're adding to them is beyond what they will get from anyone that's serving everybody. So we've got competitors that serve all verticals and they find that working with us, we actually understand the industry better, what the challenges they have specific to them rather than just to everybody. So niching can give you some, can be quite powerful if you do it right. Yeah, and look, it comes down to the age old. Yeah, what comes to mind? It's yeah. the age old. You can be a generalist in everything, or you can be an expert mm. in one thing. And if you start Correct. actually becoming that expert in that industry, and you focus your attention mm-hmm. on one thing at a time, and then once your brand mm-hmm. grows, you'll quickly scale across mm-hmm. others. But if you're in yes. a position where you only have X number of staff and X number of resources, like that company I was talking about, where they only, they only bring in mm-hmm. six clients at a time, they didn't want to go too fast. And if anything, they're having that specific vertical in mind where they focus on that. A lot of it was repetition so they could speed up that process a little bit again. But yeah, yeah. it is important to make sure you, you know what you're selling and, and to who rather than trying to sell something to everybody. Yeah, what comes to mind with that niching in vertical is like Jim's mom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you know what yes. they do. Yeah. They've got their niche and their focus, but then they've got Jim's 600 yeah. other things. Yeah. And you know what the model is, what the plan yeah. will be, but it's just a yeah, different There's no Jim's everything. So, yeah. There's no Jim's. <laughs> yeah, there's no Jim's. That's right. <laughs> it's not top Jim, but it is Jim. Yes. I think that's a fair point because they're yeah. specifically marketing to our market and one service only and they've niched and they've done it really, really well. And they mm. didn't start with 50 of them. <laughs> they started with one. And yeah. then they, I think their model was partnering with other people who knew the domain and then they basically rolled out a different vertical. So smart business model and we can learn from people like that as to what works. Mm. Um, trying to do everything just doesn't serve anybody really and it's not going to serve your customers the best because, yeah, back mm. to that 75 journey mapping, if you need to do that, there's a problem, I would say, yes. especially early days. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're very good. Yeah, either you're not understanding your customers or your product's too complicated. <laughs> One or the other. Yeah, I think it's yeah, I and mean, it's understanding the difference between what's a need and what's a necessity. 
to actually yes. to move forward? What do you need mm -hmm. that kind of that amount mm -hmm. of detail and information? Like I said, I'm a process guy. I love the information, the stats, and metrics. Yes. But it's that's to a point of you only need so much to be able to actually move forward as well. Yeah, it makes sense. So, yeah, you don't have to survey a hundred users. We had a podcast with someone the design thinking business mm. there's a handful five or six people if they give you the same answer is enough to push you forward rather than having to try and survey a hundred and get the same answer yeah i actually i heard something very similar not too long ago and um, did exactly that mm -hmm. get 80 percent of the answers in the first 10 people so really by doing the other mm -hmm. that guy's case 70 people you're only getting 20 percent more more of the answer yeah which kind of mm -hmm. doesn't exactly yep. uh, line up with reward mm -hmm. cost versus reward yeah if you're getting five or six different answers, then you've got something to continue further yes, with. But yes. if they're the same, then that's enough indication to push you forward. Yep. I want to ask a little bit about the technology that you use. Now, to track a customer journey, are we using just things like a Salesforce or an active campaign? What are you doing to track this sort of stuff other than putting things on websites and within platforms and technology? So that'll be yeah. before the yeah, platform it, uh, where panel yeah. will come Are in there after. other things that you use, like a Salesforce, for example? What are some of the things we, people can use to track the journey of their customers through the life cycle? Well, look, or there's is there so anything? many different tech out there. Whereas something yeah, like, right. like Active Campaign, where yeah. it's tracking your marketing yes. efforts and their visits to your website and yeah, CRM. There's, there's different things stuff. you can use, probably correlate, but like uh -huh. an age old pen and paper really works really well. To actually yeah. kind of map out the journey of the customer to, to kind of figure okay. out a whiteboard. Uh, that's, that's really what you want to do. And yeah, yes, there is tech out there, but a lot of the information you're going to pull isn't necessarily centralized in a single system. Um, like for example, mm -hmm. Salesforce. You that's know, a fair point. Yeah. There. Um, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know who does customer service through Salespoint. I know they, they have a module where you, so if you look at, mm -hmm. um, for example, company I worked for a couple of years back, uh, we use HubSpot from CRM for all marketing activity, sales activity. Great. All our basically sales activity was all tracked through. You could track who's open opportunities. But then as soon as it got to account management and kind of customer service, that was all Zendesk. And there was no real correlation between yeah. and we're tracking different things. And then the same with metrics wise, the, the dev team then were tracking different information through uh, Power BI. So there was no real single mm -hmm. source of truth. Again, it came down mm -hmm. to kind of mapping it out. Okay. Well, what, what does this look like? Drawing it on a whiteboard, getting it. And it's open, good for opinions as well. So you put it up on a big board and let people actually discuss yep. it and talk about it. It is a challenge because. Yeah, when you're marketing to someone, they're at a very, very, very different life cycle as a customer than when they're actually working with your business, using your product, your service. I think, yeah, there's no one business operation tool that I know of <laughs> that can manage everything from start to finish on any type of business and structure and scalable. Yeah, it doesn't really exist that I know. Anthony, you know anything like that? <laughs> Interesting product, right? No, no, it's the same thing. You're not no. niching and then you're trying to do everything yeah, for everyone. Yeah. It doesn't so really work. There are multiple products that they're to using to current. Yeah, the systems you correlate information, but I don't think there's anything to kind of put everything into a single place to, to map it out visually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think from a, a yeah. data collection point, yes. that has to be that human element, which is, which is great for me as a, as a consultant. That's a, a CX guy. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. Machines took it over. I'm out of a job. Half. <laughs> <laughs> Get it. So you've mentioned um, process quite a bit in this conversation. And mm -hmm. it's all around process improvement technically in terms of CX, but understanding it's more of the customer's um, experience and process with the business. So any key takeaways for, for a business that you would see that are really important that we haven't discussed today that you'd want to start and look at? Obviously, there's data, mm -hmm. there's talking to customers, there's focus groups. If I were to start, you'd start with the journey map, like you said. Mm -hmm. Would I jump into focus groups as soon as humanly possible? Because that's where generally the answers are with the customers, I would imagine. Uh, not necessarily. Well, you start by imagining what your customers are. Yeah, you think a lot of it then, like, I hate the word assumption. And everyone who knows me will know I hate assumption. But you have to almost start and build that out because you'd have to know what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So if you jump into a focus group, mm -hmm. you're going to start asking random yes. questions that have no relevance. You're going to start uh -huh. basically taking that away and start developing stuff from that. And then you're going to have more questions and you're going to do another focus group okay. and then you might get different answers again. So a lot of it down to is about that. Okay. As I mentioned, understanding the industry you're selling to or what you're actually selling. Ask the questions that you yourself have assumed. Unless you know the answer for gospel, ask the question. 
ask people what their likelihood is to do this or do that, or would they like to have this, or would they like to see that instead? And I suppose that the big one is actually understanding, like the, the big question I always get asked as well is CX and UX. What's the difference? And it is a really interesting one because a lot of really good UX mm. people out there who can understand how people interact and use the system, but they don't yes. necessarily understand how they come into the system in the first place. And kind of the, the mm-hmm. user might be completely different to the customer. Perfect sure. example, Salesforce. Mm-hmm. So people who use Salesforce aren't the people who actually decided to put Salesforce in place. And they're not the people who Correct. actually decide to use Salesforce. So it's about understanding that life cycle mm-hmm. and understanding who you're questioning, who, who you're targeting. And the second thing to, to be very conscious of is who is your customer? That's the, the probably the example I'll give in recruitment sense. Mm-hmm. You have candidates and clients. Your clients pay the bills. Yes. They're the ones you are actively going out working for. But if you don't have a good network of candidates, you aren't a good recruiter because you won't have anyone to be able to give mm-hmm. to those clients. So it's about being able to make sure that you're servicing everyone the right way in the way mm-hmm. they need and expect to. Which is one thing that we, we were very conscious of doing at startup. Same again, another guy I was speaking to recently, he works with, um, contractors and again, clients and not recruitment sense, but more kind of putting the two together. Mm-hmm. And I asked him the question, I said, well, who, who's your client? He said, the contractors. Why? Oh, well, they're guys who are going to pay me money. I was like, well, you won't get anything unless you have clients to use those contractors and contractors won't be using the platform. Oh, and it's kind of things like that. You just, you need to be able to differentiate and understand. Yep. I think it's important because you mentioned there, your buyer may not be the person that's using the the product. So yeah, that's where the UX and the CS can be very different and yeah. understanding the different types of users and people interacting with your business is important, especially if you're building tech and a B2B mm-hmm. play, a B2B play, you're generally going to have someone making a key decision based on business outcomes. And mm-hmm. then you're going to have users underneath based on they're doing their day to day activities within this and. They're very different people. So mm-hmm. serving both of them is required and they're different journey maps and they're different customers technically. Yeah. Yeah. And it's having that strategy, yeah. that strategy in place of actually going kind of mm-hmm. before you move forward, what yes. do you want to achieve? And the, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I'll take it back to process improvement. You have this whole mm-hmm. saying in Mean Six Sigma, like to make, define, measure, yes. analyze, improve, control, define it, actually understand what you're actually trying to do first, measure it, look at mm-hmm. what's actually out there. But then you actually look into improvements and kind of how you're going to control that. So I said analyze and group control. So there's a different ways of, of kind of looking at it. But yes, it's, it's about understanding what you have, what you think you have, sorry, what you want it to be. Be realistic about what you want it to be. Understand that yes. kind of that high level customer journey of how you're going to interact. Uh, Cause again, that will play a big part. And one of the biggest mistakes I see is when uh, people go and hire top-notch uh, kind of marketing people and talking about salespeople and spend $150,000, $200,000 a year on a, on a senior sales person, senior sales guy who is developing processes but not actually selling. Then your option before that is to hire a $90,000, $90,000 kind of BD guy who will go out and actually do feet on the ground to bring in customers. You might not be able to afford to do both. So it's kind of understanding that, okay, well, who are you going to target? How are you going to target and who do you need to, to really kind of where do you need to put your resources? You know, being more focused with your efforts. Yeah, I think you touched upon it and it's all about process definition. If you don't have a process defined, you can't bring people in just to fill in a gap. If the process mm-hmm. doesn't exist within any business or within any product, then if you bring more throw more people at it, doesn't mean it's gonna solve the problem. So this is my taking more of a holistic approach as as the business process and the engagement mm-hmm. with the customer. I think it's an interesting point there that you raised, like yeah, we need to have that better down before we can scale any business or process, really. Mm. It needs to be well-documented, working, running smoothly before we can throw more people into the process. Yeah. And if the processes are all up here yes. in your head, then it, it doesn't work with anything. <laughs> You're not going to be able to scale or get anyone in to help Correct. that or improve yeah. anything. And people don't know how to follow so, those processes either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then tracking those is another thing. So there's a, there's a bit to this, and it's a... How long does it take for someone to go down this journey? Now, that obviously depends on the size of the business, scale of the business. What, if I'm early stage, just what's, how much time should I be investing in this? Cause this is quite pivotal to business success. And we, you said, mentioned yeah. at the start of conversation, I think you said the top 10 businesses are all CX focused. And yeah, Apple would be an example of one of those. Like why? 
clearly they're solving problems for the customer and we're in business to help people get better outcomes and solve problems. That's yeah. technically what business is to create value. And if you're creating mm. value for the customer, that is the point. So how long should I be investing in designing and engineering and also continuously improving this stuff? Because there's no perfect answer to this either. No, you kind of touched on that as I mentioned. It depends on the size of the organization, what resource you have, yeah. and who's actually doing it. So I suppose, again, kind of come back to the way the way we operate is we'll, me and my business partner will sit down once every fortnight for an hour or two and actually go through, okay, well, what are yes. we doing? How are we doing? And how are we moving forward? When you get to yeah, that company I mentioned earlier where you have 40, 50 mm-hmm. people working there, I actually work one day a week with that company ongoing. So it's kind of mm-hmm. a lot more time and effort going in to, to do it. And it's because I'll do a few other bits there as well, but it's more about actually mm-hmm. delivering an outcome that's not just necessarily, mm-hmm. here you go, you go do it now yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The flip side of that, if you have the resources, you can get somebody in to come in and give you general advice and kind of draw you a map and then train your own mm-hmm. staff and kind of move forward with it as well. So, yeah, there's no real straight answer. I'd love to be able to say, yes, it's a, it's a quick two week, three week. Yeah. I think it's more down to yeah. if you're kind of in that frame line or frame of mind yeah. and you have the resources, you can probably start the ball, get the ball rolling, do a heavy project for a month, two months and then have it going ongoing activities. If you're a big organization, yeah. a lot more culture diversity, it could be a three year constant project. So it really just, it really depends. Okay. I think you mentioned... You just have to be committed probably for either one yeah. of those. Otherwise, you'll fall apart. Yeah, well, that's I think why the, I was saying the, the issue from the top. That's yeah, the correct. Top. The key, yeah. key takeaway for me is if you're a customer-focused business, this is an ongoing thing because the customers mm-hmm. are always changing, problems are always changing, customer needs are always changing and evolving, and we need to be continued as business. If you want to improve business and be better business people and serving our customers, mm-hmm. we need to continuously work on this. And I think this is... Um, Something that's important, you can't just build it over a month and then we have a customer experience design process all done for the next five years. I don't think it works like that. It's like software. You're building something, you're iterating, you're learning, you're evolving, and you're looking to always continuously improve. And it's one of these areas that, um, yeah, to get better and to better serve our customers, we need to focus and continuously improve. Yeah, otherwise you build it to language. Yeah, correct. Mm. Don't even start. But yeah, as, exactly. as mentioned, it, it is exactly like software. It's one of those, though, if you yes. do it properly, it takes mm-hmm. minimal amount of maintenance to actually keep it up, to kind yeah. of keep it ongoing. Where if yep. you do a really poorly at start, and if you, like I call them the Jenga block systems, if you just patch together like yeah. different bits and pieces, and now all of a sudden you want to change yes. something in 12 months' time and the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. Regardless, if you actually put it together as a sturdy brick house, where if you need to add little bits to it, you're fine. You can keep adding and adding and adding or taking little bits away, but the structure is there. I think that's probably the, the biggest part of making sure, especially startups, that they get in early, get the work done, do it. You don't necessarily have to hire a consultant to do it. Like again, there's there's a lot of tools and literature out there. There's a lot of great books out there you can read and do. It really comes down to your availability and your effort and kind of what your resources are, yes. especially startups, a lot of bootstrapped. I know that. I do a lot, yeah. I do a lot of pro bono work to, for that reason. Yeah. And what I'd say is if anyone wants to actually ask any questions or kind of get a bit more yeah. of a, a direction as where they go, always feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to take a call. And you mentioned a couple of books. What's some examples that if you've got any off the top of your head that someone might jump into if they're looking to venture into this area? Um, it depends what, if you want to go Pacific. So like I've got design thinking. Actually, I've got it right here. Yep. I'm not going to set it up. Mm-hmm. Yep. Probably... That's one I finished a few months ago. Sprint. Okay. Guy who wrote it, Jake Knapp. He's ex Google Ventures. They came up with it. It's not Sprint like Agile mm-hmm. Sprint. It's more about how to actually yeah. design, think a new product or feature. Really recommend okay. it read. I actually ordered it and did the audio book before it even arrived. So I listened to the audio book in a single <laughs> day. I was just hooked. Uh, yes. Great book. Nice. Okay. Customer experience wise, there's the Outside In, which is the probably one of the, the most popular books. Really good for that kind, of, especially those case studies and some of the things I mentioned today. Yes. Probably I got it out of that book as well. And then thirdly, the the good one that I came across recently, Jane Bliss is a Chief Customer Officer 2.0. Really uh-huh. good on why organisations should actually implement a Chief Customer Officer and how that works. So there's a there's three books that should keep you going for a few weeks. Beautiful. No, thanks for sharing those out. And um, mm-hmm. if anyone wants to reach out to you, Brendan, and get in touch because. 
Some people may be at the time where they decide that maybe we need some help and outside in, sometimes looking at these things internally can be a little bit challenging. So getting a consultant mm-hmm. in may actually help open up different insights. So take the yeah, blinkers take the blinkers off. off. Yeah. So well, how can I get in contact with you? LinkedIn? Do you, do, uh, what's LinkedIn your is probably the easiest way. Uh, they they yep. jump on the website, ftexecutive.com.au. Yeah, if you look at the customer consulting side, we have it all there, all the information, basically okay. some of the some of the bits we do, a bit of training, we do training as well, so we help people scale up their, their own teams. Yes. But LinkedIn is probably the best way to, to jump on. Sounds good, Brennan. Oh, yeah, we'll put them in yeah, the we'll notes. Yeah, we'll put all the notes. But thanks for yeah. joining us today. It's been a little bit eye-opening in terms of what customer experience is. I think the word gets dropped around a little bit, but understanding it is all about process, understanding what you're doing from start to finish on that customer journey, and then iterating and evolving it. I think it's some good insight from today. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. It's uh, it's been fun. Cheers, mate.